For years, running emulators on Xbox One and Xbox Series consoles was a relatively easy proposition. Complete some configuration work, grab some emulator links from a friend or from a Discord chat room, and you are in business. Advanced emulators ran very well on Xbox, and they could run on a completely unmodified retail console. But last month, Microsoft essentially pulled the plug on Xbox emulation, blocking all emulation apps from running on regular Xbox consoles to the dismay of many. Thankfully, there is a way to circumvent this restriction that seems like it's here to stay, running the emulators in a console boot mode built for game developers. So today we're going to get a range of emulators back up and running on a Series S console by using this dev mode workaround and test performance and features on cutting edge emulators. Is the new face of Xbox game emulation worth the hassle or do the limitations of dev mode make for an unsatisfying experience? The Xbox developer mode can be pretty intimidating at first glance, and isn't really ideal for launching and playing software. You have to restart your console to go in and out of developer mode and retail mode, with a set storage partition for both. It's a big hassle, and I'd strongly recommend running on a secondary Xbox console that can be left in dev mode for the smoothest experience. So we're going to set things up on a natural secondary console, the pint-sized and cut-cost Xbox Series S, and see how we can get games to run. The setup process is very involved and not at all intuitive. There are resources online to walk you through the process step by step, which I'd recommend consulting as it would take me quite a while to explain in this video. I imagine it will take most people between 30 minutes and an hour to complete these on-screen steps, which are the steps I personally took to get everything online and running. The other barrier to getting dev mode emulation set up is cost. There's a $20 US one-time fee to register a developer account with Microsoft, which is the very first thing that you have to do. But there are no continuing fees or costs, so it's a fairly cheap setup all things considered. Once you have everything configured, of course, you can move on to playing the software itself. With the Xbox configured this way, it will boot into an easy to navigate dashboard interface at first glance, perfectly capable of running side-loaded UWP or universal Windows platform apps. RetroArch is the key emulation platform here, as it offers a huge range of cores within a fairly easy to use front end, meaning that once we complete the configuration process, we can emulate just about any console you can think of, from old arcade boards to sixth gen home systems. Later on, we will be downloading some emulators separately that have their own UWP applications, but RetroArch is the most straightforward solution for most systems. Let's start from the bottom up with some more basic 8 and 16-bit titles. When we boot up each game, we get a selection of emulation cores to pick from to run that game. I did notice that some of the core options can make RetroArch crash, but mostly there are no issues. The Series S is perfectly capable of some good results here, like you might expect, without any real emulation issues above and beyond what you would get on a PC. That's because we're getting the same emulation cores that you have access to on other platforms, so the experience should be broadly the same. That doesn't mean that the emulation will be perfect, of course, but for mainstream 8 and 16-bit systems, you won't run into substantial issues with most titles. That includes some of the more ambitious Game Boy Advance titles, like the excellent but very low framerate version of Doom that hit the console in 2001, or the hilariously low res and choppy video cartridges that packed TV episodes into about a dozen megabytes. More challenging SNES titles fare fine as well, like Yoshi's Island and other Super FX based games. There are also RetroArch shaders that you can experiment with for these older games, like shaders to emulate the look of CRT displays, although a lot of these don't play super well with the Xbox's Direct3D API, so you will need to be selective. My only complaint would come down to controls. I don't feel like the Xbox pad is all that well suited to D-pad based titles, given the lower position of the D-pad and how the actuation of the D-pad buttons tends to be quite pronounced. This will come down to personal preference, of course, but I do think that it's not ideal for this class of game. Next up are lower end 3D titles, games that came out on 5th gen and early 3D handheld hardware. I had no issues whatsoever with PS1 titles, which all seemed to render correctly on the default available core. Not exactly surprising, but the console does do a satisfactory job with Sony's first console. But when I stepped over to the N64, the games I tried simply would not work no matter what emulator I tried. 
The problem here seems to be that I had updated the N64 cores, which caused some issues with RetroArch running on Xbox. So I reinstalled RetroArch without updating any of my emulation cores, and that seemed to resolve the issue. Emulation quality seemed fine, with a lot of available options across the two supplied emulation cores. I didn't encounter any real issues, at least issues that would be unique to Xbox emulation, across the games that I sampled. Both early 3D portables, the Nintendo DS and Sony PSP, run perfectly well too. DS is a bit problematic owing to the obvious interface issues, but games that don't require the touchscreen, like Mario Kart DS, are very playable and run well. PSP titles under PPSSPP tend to run very well on other platforms, and the same is true here. It's pretty trivial to get a title like God of War, Ghost of Sparta, up and running at 4K resolution and hitting a full 60 frames per second, for instance. Everything I tried on PSP ran like a dream, really, with no issues whatsoever. When we step up to 6th gen consoles, we start to see the true hardware limits of the Series S when it comes to emulation. Running Dolphin under RetroArch, we're mostly looking at pretty solid performance. Mario Kart Double Dash and Mario Kart Wii both run at a pretty solid 60 frames per second, and both feel quite excellent on the hardware. Resident Evil 4 manages a solid 30 FPS for the most part, but is unfortunately plagued by frame pacing issues that I wasn't able to configure a way through RetroArch. F-Zero GX tends to be a bit of a stress test for GameCube emulation and doesn't fare especially well here. It's mostly a 60 FPS experience, but does drop frames frequently, which doesn't feel great. Some of the tracks also induce bizarrely low frame rates for extended periods for some reason. On the plus side, the Dolphin emulator seems mostly CPU limited on an Xbox, and you can dial up the resolution scale considerably without a big performance penalty, so getting a crisp version of F-Zero or Mario Kart is very achievable. Unfortunately, RetroArch's PCX-S2 emulation core for PS2 titles failed every time I tried to run a game. But there is a dedicated PS2 emulator available for Xbox called SBSX2, which again is based on PCX-S2. After dropping in a PS2 BIOS, it's pretty easy to get running and the results are pretty excellent, I would say. God of War operates at a stable 60 FPS, even with a 3x resolution scale, producing a smooth experience even in its most demanding moments. Ratchet & Clank, which is a pretty demanding game on emulators, is also in good shape and hits 60 FPS as well, though I did note a bug with the shadow rendering here. Resident Evil 4's PS2 release, which is typically considered the inferior 6th gen console version, runs at a very nice, perfectly frame-paced 30 FPS. I was impressed with the performance of this emulator, and it's up there with the experience of running PC XS2 on a good desktop computer. Original Xbox is out of the picture here unfortunately, as a core isn't available within RetroArch, and Zemu doesn't have a UWP port. Dreamcast is available, however, and I elected to use a dedicated emulation app called Flycast to give it a quick run through. The Dreamcast is a somewhat simpler console than its 6th gen contemporaries, and a relatively easy machine for the Series S to emulate. I popped in Soul Calibur and Daytona USA, and both ran without issue under Flycast at a full 60 frames per second. Capping things off, Xenia, the most advanced, non-proprietary Xbox 360 emulator is available as a UWP app as well. Running Xenia in its frequently updated Canary version, we can get in-game in a lot of Xbox 360 titles, and performance isn't necessarily awful either. Street Fighter 4 is a good example, running between 50 and 60 FPS with no visible graphical abnormalities. It's a perfectly playable experience that isn't a universe away from playing it on original hardware. More demanding titles usually don't fare quite as well. Grid 2 is mostly at or around its 30 FPS target, but the game suffers from occasional stutters, and has obvious issues when displaying certain car textures. Forza Horizon also has certain visual glitches, but it's also racked with extremely poor performance, characterized by near constant hitches. And I couldn't get in-game at all on Vanquish, which crashed after displaying the Sega logo. It's pretty cool that Xenia can turn in okay results in the Series S at all, but it's still fairly unreliable. Of course, Series S has high quality official emulation available, coupled with resolution boosts for some select titles. So Xenia is more of a curiosity than something most people will want to rely on. I would have loved to look at our PCS3 for PS3 emulation as well, but a UWP build of the emulator isn't currently available.
I'm a bit conflicted about emulation on Xbox Series consoles. On the one hand, Microsoft has made it an absolute pain to set up requiring a lengthy and unintuitive developer mode configuration. RetroArch UWP is a bit buggy. Certain features like game scanning don't really work. Direct 3D11 throws up issues when running certain emulators. It crashes occasionally when running games and changing its configuration can be a lot more complicated than on a PC. Plus you need to set your default boot to developer mode. So enjoying retail titles requires a console restart. But if you can stomach all of that, the emulation experience itself is solid. Emulators up to and including 6th gen consoles run well enough, just like you'd see on a decent PC. The various front ends are easily navigable with a controller, making for a good living room experience. Plus the $20 price of admission is pretty cheap, providing you already have an Xbox Series console. Developer mode isn't a bad way to go as long as you're willing to jump through some extra hoops. It is sort of amusing that any of this works at all. The reason we can get emulators up and running in the first place is because of Microsoft's various attempts, most of them quite ill-fated, to expand Windows software beyond PCs. Universal Windows Platform was built in an era when Microsoft was targeting mass market tablets and phones. And with the death of those hopes, UWP itself has been abandoned. Microsoft's relative openness to developers means that you can do a lot of interesting things with an Xbox console that the other platform holders don't allow. And that deserves some commendation. I am still very annoyed that Microsoft disabled emulators in retail mode, but developer mode still proves pretty decent for enjoying emulation. Just expect a lot of hassles along the way. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and press the bell for YouTube notifications. Check out the Patreon at digitalfoundry.net for exclusive and early access content. And to get in touch, just use Twitter. Thanks for watching.